with calculus, as with really any other math, there is no try, there's only do. So there's not different ways to get the derivative of a square root. There's one way to do it. So I've given you the rule, you just have to apply it the right way. So what I didn't do, I gave you the rules, and I didn't do any examples. So let's go ahead and do some examples right now. And these will all be read off the power rule, which was somewhere. Do some crazy algebra. There it is, power rule. So derivative, you lower the power by one and multiply it by the original power. So that's the power rule right there. So let's do some examples right off the power rule. So we'll start off really easy. So power rule on this one. So multiply by 6. x, 6 minus 1 is 5. That's it. That's power rule right there. So this square root is a 1 half power. So I'm going to write that first. The most important thing you can do with square roots is write them as powers. Now, what do you have to do? Multiply by a half. What do I do to the power? Subtract one. Subtract one. So there is no try, there's only do. What's one half minus one? Negative one half. Oh, very good. Negative one half. And if you. So subtracting one might be the hardest part of this section. <coughs> it's a little weird, especially if your fractions are negative. Then you got to think, ah, well, that's really minus three over three, common denominator, and all that. So you know what I didn't write is this is really one half minus two halves, but we're in calc class, so I'm going to skip the common denominator part of subtracting one. So just remember, you're subtracting one. You better work in halves or thirds or sevenths, whatever your denominator is. And things are a little tr more tricky if it was already negative, you're still going to subtract 1. Now, if you want to rewrite this, you could write it as 1 over 2. Negative is a reciprocal, and 1 half is still a square root. So you could write it like this. On your, if I gave this question to you on a quiz, I would use that answer right there. Because I've gotten rid of the DDX, I've done the derivative, calculus is done. You better subtract 1 from 1 half. If you can't do that, if you leave it like this, I'm going to take a point off. You can subtract 1 from any fraction I give you. You know, if it, even if it was something tricky like 3 sevenths, you can subtract 7 sevenths from 3 sevenths and then tell me it's negative 4 sevenths. So you need to be able to subtract 1 off of any fraction. All right, next up. Yes. So you've all seen Star Wars at some yes. point? Yes. So you know Yoda yes. or Obi-Wan. They give very good advice overall. So there's no try, there's only do. You either know the rules and do them correctly, or you don't know the rules and therefore don't do them correctly. That's why I wrote down math. There's no try, there's only do. Carlson or Yoda, take your pick. OK. That'll work. So let's get crazy. Take this derivative. Take it on your paper. Don't use your pen <laughs> or pencil, whatever you're writing with. I'm limited because my 
actual pen that I write it with is really thick, so I can't write my numbers too small or they'll just look like a blob. So if I had a you know, mechanical pencil like most of you have or a pen, it's ba I'm basically writing with a Sharpie trying to do math. So I can't write that much more small than I did right here. All right, so that is all power rule practice. And let's do What rule does this use? So square root 20, whatever number that is, it's just a number. So this is a constant right here. So what's derivative of any constant, any number? Zero. 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 So that was our constant. Uh, derivatives are always zero. And what other rules we had? Oh no. See, power rule, constant multiple. Ooh, constant multiple rule. Let's do an example from that. That's not three. Number five. So constant multiple rule, I'll write that, rewrite that down here. So constant multiple rule says you can bring numbers or constants outside the derivative. So step one, this is three times d dx of x to the fourth. So write that one down, take that derivative now. Any questions on that constant multiple? <coughs> All right, sum difference rule. I'm going to write down the sum difference rule, and then we're going to apply it. So you can take the derivative across addition or subtraction and take two separate derivatives and then add those together. So that's how sums and differences work. Now if I don't put parentheses here, the derivative operates on what's to the right. So without parentheses, it would be just the derivative of this plus the other stuff. So I want to take the derivative of the whole entire expression, so I'm going to wrap it with parentheses. So now it's the derivative of all three terms. So what we're really doing is taking three derivatives. So this is equal to... minus, oh no, 1 over square root x. Well, you should always write with powers whenever you can. So square root x is 1 half power. It's also reciprocal. So I'm going to write it times x to the negative 1 half power. So negative reciprocates it, and then the half power is a square root. How do I deal with the reciprocal of x to the 2 thirds? This is 6 times x to what power? Yep, just negative 2 thirds. That's how we'll bring it to the top. So now all you have is three just regular power rules. So you're going to take those powers up there, subtract one, multiply by the original power. So take these three derivatives. They sort of go easy to difficult, left to right.
So if you don't like what I wrote, it's probably because I skipped a step or two. So bring down the 5, 3 times 5 is 15, x to the 1 less than 5 is 4. So first one should be pretty obvious. What's the step I didn't show on this one? This is negative 2 thirds times negative 1 half, x to the minus 1 half minus 1. So I saw the 2, 2 cancel, negatives make a positive, and then 1 thirds what's left over. And then negative 1 half minus 1, which I recommend that you do these subtractions somewhere. It's very easy to subtract one incorrectly. So negative one half minus one is negative three halves. I'll make sure that you're careful with that. I'm showing you how to not be careful because I've taken these derivatives uh, probably 700 times or so. When you've taken your 700 derivative, you can skip steps too. All right, last up, we had six times negative two thirds x to the negative two thirds minus one. So six cancels the three giving a two times negative two is negative four and negative two thirds minus three thirds negative five thirds. So those are the intermediate steps I didn't show. I recommend you show intermediate steps. So questions on this. So this is our answer to the derivative. And that should get you started on a lot of the homework problems, hopefully. Would you want to circle our answer like that on a quiz if you do have a bunch of notes around it or whatever? Usually I'll have a box for you to write your answer in. And so that, that would be, yeah, rewrite it up there. Or you can take your time and write it more clear. So we did some difference rule, now we're gonna do product rule. All right, so those are all the examples covering all the rules we did so far. So this is the derivative of two functions multiplied together. So I'll, first of all, I'll write what it is not. It is not the two derivatives multiplied together. So that is not the product rule. That's probably the most common miswritten product rule right there. So none of you are going to write this or use this fake product rule. So it is the derivative of f times g plus regular f times the derivative of g. So at this point, the notation gets pretty ugly. There's a lot of f's, g's, x's all over the place. So there's a few better ways to write it. So if I go with prime notation, this is f prime g plus f g prime. That's a way to rewrite it without x's hanging out all over the place, so it looks a little nicer. And I'm actually going to explicitly put a multiplication symbol in here so we know it's multiplication, not function composition. That'll be a rule coming up where you don't multiply them. If f is eating g, you have a different, uh, very different rule. So how in the world are we going to prove this? So where do we start on the proof? So suppose f and g are diffable. And like all the other proofs, we're going to start with, well, let's just take the derivative using definition.
So that's what the difference quotient looks like. You just replace x by x plus h and minus the original function divided by h. So there's difference quotient. Now we have to get fancy. So this step is not obvious. Kind of. We are going to factor, definitely. So why, so why I did that is not obvious. But why is it OK to do this? So what do I get if I add those two terms that I just put in there? I get 0. So I added 0. So it's OK to add 0. Now why did I add 0? We'll find out. So we're about to factor here. So what I want to factor out and be looking at is fx plus h minus fx over h. And somewhere else I want to see uh, gx plus h minus gx. So we're going to factor the first two together. And then we're going to factor the second two. So what can I factor out of this first, these first two terms? g of x plus h. So I'm going to get g of x plus h times fx plus h minus fx divided by h plus and what kind of factor out of the second two terms? f of x. I'm left with gx plus h minus g of x. And then I just split the fractions up right there. They have common denominators, so I just took the two fractions and wrote them as a sum. So I haven't done any calculus yet. This is just definition and uh, algebra. So I haven't done any actual calculus yet. So I'm going to use the limit rule, limit law, where limit of a sum is you can take each limit separately. So I'm going to apply the limit to both of these two terms. All right, we're almost there. We just need to, I'm going to use the product rule for limits. Very different than the product rule for derivatives. Very, very different. Product rule for limits is nice. You just take the limit of the first term, multiply by the limit of the second term. So there's my first limb, my second limb.
So let's do the easier stuff first. I think the right on the right side is easier than the left side. All right, we'll do this limit is super easy. Does f of x care about h? No. Nope. So on this limit, it wouldn't even matter if h approaches 0 or anything else. This is just f of x. There's no h in there. What is this limit? So it's a definition. What is this a definition of? Derivative. So this is g prime of x right here. So this is the derivative of g. And we'll write that g prime of x. That's the definition of what the derivative is. We assume that f and g were differentiable. So this limit will be defined. All right, now we're going to move over to the slightly more complicated side. Let's start with the easy part of that. What is this limit here? F prime. F prime a. That's f prime. It's the derivative of f. Now, this one's a little bit tricky. We're going to use a theorem that we had before. So when am I allowed to push the limit through the function? If it's continuous. Why is G continuous? Fractions or <coughs> so remember, I started with assuming g was differentiable. And if you're differentiable, you have to be continuous. We did that proof yesterday, no, last class, Thursday, I don't know, some point last week. If you're differentiable, you have to be continuous. So this, this step right here was because g was continuous. That's what allowed us to push a limit through the function. Now, easy, what's the limit of h approaches 0 of x plus h? X. That's just x. So that limit's super easy. So we just have g of x, f prime of x, plus f of x, g prime of x. And we can just reorder this stuff. Multiplication is commutative over the real numbers and complex numbers. So this is f prime x g of x plus f g prime, right there. Yeah. But wouldn't it be negative x? Uh oh. Because h is it plus h? Yeah, so plus 0 is what's happening. It's x plus a really small quantity, positive or negative, okay. but that quantity is getting smaller. Okay. So in the limit, that's just x. It's basically a constant plus the identity, where it's weird because the constant's x as far as the limit is concerned. So the limit uses the variable h, not the variable x. So that's, that's what might feel a little strange here. Okay. Uh, we're used to x being the variable, but in this case, h is the actual variable, where x was fixed at the top somewhere. Uh, when I assumed, I didn't write this all the way down, but f and g are differentiable at x. So x is some value that they're, they have derivatives. So if you're given like a homework problem with a point, that would be your x? Yeah, a lot of times I'll give you a value, x equals 1, or okay. whatever it happens to be. Okay. And then uh, put this, as long as you're differentiable at x, this is the product rule. Now, if you're not differentiable at x, you can't really do calculus. So almost every function I'm going to give you is going to be differentiable overall. All right, that is product rule. Uh, let me circle the best form. Uh, you're going to see u's and v's in your textbook a lot, so I'll start writing those down. So that's a good one to put on a note card right there. So u v prime is u prime v plus u v prime. You basically take the derivative of each piece, multiplied by the other one.
So we're going to rewrite this as uv prime, where u is 3x squared minus 4, and v, x to the fifth, we're going to do calculus, so rewrite the square root as a half power. So there's u and v. Now take the derivative of u, take the derivative of v, and then, so get their derivatives, and then plug it back into the original with the product rule happening. Okay, product rule questions. If I just asked you derivative, I would accept this as your answer. Uh, I am going to do a whole bunch of algebra though. So I'm going to expand it out and then combine like terms. So this is a correct answer, so I'll put a box around it. So this is 6x to the 6th minus 6x to the 3 halves power plus, now I have to FOIL here, 15x to the 6th minus 3 halves x to the 3 halves power F O I minus twenty X to the fourth. Last is plus two X to the minus half power. All right, six plus fifteen is twenty one X to the six. We'll go decreasing powers of X. Minus 20x to the fourth. Six, four. I got three halves and three halves. Ooh. So that's minus 15 halves x to the three halves. half plus 2x to the minus 1 half power. 
Is there? R three x squared. So that'll be negative three halves x to the four halves minus a half. So that's three halves power. Okay. So here's the all the like terms are combined. We go with decreasing powers of x. So now I'm going to start over. Except I want you to FOIL first, so do algebra first, combine like terms if there are any, and then take derivative. So we're going to do algebra first. So you know how to FOIL. If you just got through that last FOILing, you can get through this FOILing. You should get four terms out of here. Algebra questions on distributing. So now take a derivative. This derivative should be not too tricky. You just got four things, derivative of each piece. So if you made it through that correctly, well, what should you be noticing? It's the same thing. So you can do algebra or calculus. As long as you do it correctly, you can do them in either order. So you can do algebra first, calculus second, or calculus first, algebra second. As long as you do them correctly, you'll get to the same thing. This should seem kind of crazy. Our calculus, we did calculus first and then a whole bunch of algebra and we got these weird product rules and everything simplified down to the exact same thing we got when we did our algebra first, calculus second. Well, we're not making, we, so we proved that everything works. So there's nothing that I've told you that I said, trust me. Yes, so uh, I'm just going to write that down. You can do algebra first, calculus second, or algebra and calculus can be done in any order. So the math way to write that is algebra and calculus are commutative operations. However you spell calculus. We just get rid of that.
So sometimes it's better to just take derivative of the original without doing any algebra and clean up at the end. Sometimes it's better to clean it up at the beginning as best you can and then do algebra afterwards, or take your derivative afterwards. All right, oh, quotient rule. We're not going to do proof of the quotient rule. So this one will be because I said so. There's the quotient rule written out with f's and g's. Of course, that's a little bit ugly to write down. So if we write it down with abbreviated notation, it looks like this. So it's a good time to make sure your u's don't look like your v's. My v's don't generally have a sharp point, so I make sure my u's have a foot. So I can see my u's have a little foot going out to the right, so I know it's a U, not a V. If I erase those little feet, they look pretty similar. So if you've got sharp Vs, your U's don't need a foot. If you don't have sharp Vs, make sure you can tell them apart. All right, quotient rule is right there. So we did an example of the product rule, we'll do one with the quotient rule. So you can write down u and v. u prime v prime. Actually, I'll write them below. I left enough space. So go ahead and write it out. And I do want you to simplify this down as much as you can.
So you went down the left column. If you simplified all the way, you could do algebra first, which I did up here. So I just took that x in the denominator and multiplied everything by 1 over x. So x squared became x, x became 1, and then 1 became 1 over x. And then I just wrote, I pulled the 1 half uh, coefficient through the derivative. So it's 1 half times the derivative of all that stuff, and then just took the derivative down there. So I'm showing you, you can do algebra first, calculate a second, or vice versa. Depends on which way you want to go. Sometimes the algebra it takes to simplify it, so your calculus is easier, becomes pretty difficult. So it's not always the best move to go algebra. Usually it's better to try to simplify, but you could spend too much time trying to simplify. And if you make an algebra mistake, that of course will make your answer wrong. So I just squared the 2. That's 2x times 2x is 2 squared x squared. All right, so that's quotient rule. Let's rewrite all of our rules together in one spot. All right, constant multiple rule. So the derivative of a number c is 0. So we have c is constant. So c times u derivative is c times just the derivative of u. That's a constant multiple rule. u plus v prime, u prime plus v prime. Same thing with difference. We have product rule, u times v prime is u prime v plus u v prime. u over v, u prime v minus u v prime divided by v squared. So there's all the rules in one spot. So let's talk about ways to think about the derivative. So the derivative of a function is another function. The derivative of some function is some other function. There are some derivatives that are the derivative is itself, but you're not going to see those till next quarter. So our derivatives of a function are going to be some different function. I think the only difference is the derivative of 0 is 0, because it's constant. So that's the only example we really have where a derivative is itself. So if you have some function and you apply ddx, you get f prime. And you could then take the derivative of that function. So if we apply another ddx, we will get f double, oops, f double prime. And if I apply another derivative, I'll get f triple prime. At some point, it gets annoying to keep going with that notation. So we make this notation right here. If you write a parenthesized exponent, that says the nth derivative. So if we apply a ddx to this, we'll get f to the n plus 1. 
So you got the nth derivative, you take another derivative, you get n plus first derivative. So ddx is a linear operator. What that means alpha and beta are constants, constants. This is alpha ddx of f plus beta ddx of g. So you can split up derivatives over addition and multiplication. And that's what it means to be a linear operator. Now if you are not didn't take linear algebra, you don't need to worry about that. And if you did take linear algebra, you still don't need to worry about that. But this is just comes from the constant multiple rule and the sum rule. You get the linear oper operator properties.